Good day in today's MAPE 8 class in arts. We are going to discuss the arts and crafts, culture and artifacts of Southeast Asia. In this module, the learners are expected to identify the external, foreign, and internal, indigenous, influences that are reflected in the design of an artwork and in the making of a craft or artifact in Southeast Asian countries. Incorporate the design, form, and spirit of Southeast Asian artifacts and objects in one's creation through using localized materials. And, relish the contribution of Southeast Asian art from analyzing the nature and background of the following countries. Indonesia, Malaysia, Vietnam, Cambodia, Thailand and Singapore. Let's us bind. The Southeast Asian Influence The Southeast Asian arts are comprised of Thailand, Laos, Vietnam, Cambodia, Myanmar, formerly known as Burma, Indonesia and Singapore. It is also known as the art of Indochina and East Indies. Most of the Southeast Asian culture are influenced by several outside factors. They are historically overshadowed by the great empires of nearby India and China. They are also colonized and suppressed by a variety of different nations, all of different cultures and languages coming from the following. USA, France, Netherlands, Portugal and Spain. This gives Southeast Asia a background of shared influences and entirely differing influences. A number of cohesive traits predate the Indian influence even though the cultural development of the area was once dominated by Indian influence. Look at the map and see how its trade was done before that is why influences easily propagated. The indigenous influences. The races from Southeast Asia were formerly open-minded, rather than creative, during their contacts with outside developments. Some scholars argue against the accepted theory during prehistoric times that their civilizations moved from China to Southeast Asia. However, after the excavations and discoveries in Myanmar and Thailand, these scholars contended and accepted the said theory. Some of the evidences are the peoples of mainland Southeast Asia which cultivates plants, making pottery and working in bronze about the same time as the peoples of the ancient Middle East. Southeast Asians do not have a strong tradition of art theory or literary or even in dramatic criticism, for they are always more concerned with doing the actual work of accomplishing the genuine work of delivering excellent things. Since the Southeast Asians, particularly in the western portion of the territory, took a shot at non-durable materials, it is absurd to expect to follow the turn of events and advancement of works of art stage by stage. The region has always been thickly forested, so it was natural that the first material to be used for artistic purposes should have been wood. They preserved the wood carving tradition begun in ancient times, even when they learned to work with metals and with stone. Wood carving flourished long after the Great Age of stone sculpture and stone architecture, which ended in the 13th century. Similarly, the cave painting testifies to the continuity of the magico-religious tradition connected with all the arts of the area. For external influences in Southeast Asia, winds of change often came like a storm. Indian trade ventured into Southeast Asia in the early hundreds of years of the Common Era. Although it is peaceful in nature, it caused revolutionary changes in the life and culture of the peoples in the region. 
The Indians would visit in the region in small numbers for two or three monsoons only, but it still it marks a massive influence. The success of their commercial venture and the safety of their persons depended entirely on the goodwill of the inhabitants. The Indians brought new thoughts and new craftsmanship traditions. Since these thoughts had some understanding with indigenous ideas and art forms, the natives acknowledged them but were not submerged by an invasion of new traditions. The first layer of native ideas and traditions has remained strong up to the present day. However, the Hindu and Buddhist cultures of the Indians made a tremendous impact and came to form the second layer of culture in Southeast Asia. Different Southeast Asian Arts and Their Significance In Thailand we have Thai silk. Thai silk is produced from the cocoons of silkworms. It is mainly produced in Korat which is the center of the silk industry in Thailand. Thai weavers from this region raise the caterpillars on a steady diet of mulberry leaves. In Malaysia we have batik. The term, batik, is an Indonesian Malay word. Believed to be related to the Malay word, titik, which means point, dot, or drop. It uses resist technique. Covering areas of cloth with a dye resistant substance, usually hot wax, to prevent them from absorbing colors. Batik design is used in Southeast Asian country particularly Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore and Brunei. Two main types of batik one is hand painted that uses the canting, a small copper container with one or more different sized pipes. The second type of batik is block printed which is done by welding together strips of metal to form a metal block. The metal block is then dipped into molten wax and pressed against the fabric in order to make a pattern. Let us watch us watch how batik is being designed and made. The designs you're looking at come from an art or craft known as batik. It's been around for centuries and originated in Java, Indonesia. Batik has been part of an ancient tradition that you can now see at work here in this factory that was established in 1973. I love going behind the scenes to see how that finished product actually gets created. And we're gonna do just that. See these different blocks? These are actual designs. And those designs are applied to typically two types of fabric, either silk or cotton. What this gentleman's doing is he's taking one of those, one of those designs, he's dipping it in hot paraffin wax, and he's stamping the cloth. Underneath here, the reason this table is spongy is because they put a sponge underneath that absorbs cool water that allows the paraffin wax to set up immediately and harden. What you get is something like this prior to the next process. And as you can see, this is wax. There's no color to the fabric yet because it has yet to be painted. Now that's not the only way you can do this. You can use the block and that's the cheaper version or you can do a hand painting. And what this lady did is she designed and hand drew these elements. And now she's using that little tool to apply the paraffin wax to the design. The reason they do that is so that the colors that are then applied next don't bleed into the various areas. You'll see that effect here in this next step. Notice how the paraffin keeps everything separated. And this is a very detailed process by which this person's going to hand paint this entire design. As you come down to the next spot here, you'll start to get an idea of what the finished product is going to look like. The finished product still has the wax on it 
and the color has been painted, but it hasn't been set up, meaning it, it's not color fast yet. They actually take these cloths and they put it into a special mixture and it makes the fabric and the color bind so it doesn't bleed out when it gets washed in the future, but you still have that paraffin wax. You have to get rid of the wax. So how do you get rid of the wax? The way you get rid of the wax is you boil the piece as the final step. Then you've got a finished product and of course a piece of Malaysia to take home with you. In Thailand as well, they are very famous for the sky flying lantern. Flying lanterns are made out of rice paper with a bamboo frame, which contain a fuel cell or small candle. It is used during the year for festivals, the most popular being the Loi Kratong festival celebrations. It is held on the night of the 12th full moon, usually in November, with Chiang Mai believed to have the brightest and most spectacular. In Indonesia, Wayang Kulit is very popular in all ages. Shadow Puppet Theatre of Indonesia. Wayang means to show or perform and Kulit means skin. A traditional gamelan orchestra would accompany the storytelling. In Malaysia their kite is popular like here in the Philippines, they have wow kite. It is a uniquely designed Malaysian kite. Its wings are similar to an Arabic letter, pronounced wow. Pasir Gudang International Kite Festival is a festival that features different colorful wow kite. Additional information for Southeast Asian relief sculptures. We have three types. And the first one is the alto form relief. It is as almost completely carved from its surface highly shaped, with very little of the structure touching the base or plane. In the Philippines we have this kind of alto form relief sculpture in Bonifacio Shrine in Manila. The second is the Ba form relief. It is a relief that barely extends past the base common as wall decorations on Greek or Roman buildings and are the type mostly seen on the Colosseum. This one is free-standing or it can stand on its own. In the Philippines, have you think of any Ba form relief sculptures? We have the Rizal Monument at Rizal Park or Luneta. In Singapore they have the famous Merlion. Second one is the sunken relief sculptures. It is an image that is carved into the surface rather than out of it. In Cambodia, they have the famous Angkor Wat. This temple has a lot of sculptures. Stone carving has been both a passion and a livelihood for many Cambodian sculptors. The art of stone carving in Cambodia has a very long, fascinating history which goes back to the foundation of the Khmer Nation. The most important narrative represented at Angkor Wat is the churning of the ocean of milk. It depicts a story about the beginning of time and the creation of the universe. It is also a story about the victory of good over evil which depicts a story about the beginning of time and the creation of the universe. In Thailand they have a lot of Buddha sculptures. Thailand is world famous for its sculpture that dates back 4,000 years. The most commonly used materials are wood, stone, ivory, clay, and various metals. This famous sculpture in Wat Pha in Bangkok is 46 meters long and 15 meters high. It is made of plaster on a brick core and finished in gold leaf. Seated Buddha it is made up of bronze. 
believed to be used as cultural or historical relic of ancient Buddhist in Thailand. Indonesia is known for its stone, bronze, and Iron Age arts. The sculptures can be found in numerous archaeological sites in Sumatra, Java to Sulawesi. The native Indonesian tribes usually create sculptures that depict ancestors, deities, and animals. This is evident in the pre-Hindu Buddhist and pre-Islamic sculptures from the tribes. The Balinese Mask of Indonesia made up of goat's skin and buffalo hair to boar's teeth. It is used to scare off evil spirits, to connect with ancestors, cure sickness and to prevent natural disasters like floods, famine and drought. In Myanmar, it uses wood, stone and plaster as sculpting materials. The sadik is a wooden chest, bound in lacquer and used for centuries in Myanmar. Used both in monasteries and the royal court, to hold palm leaf manuscripts, sermons, poetry, prayers and orders. The Merlion is also partly inspired by the story of how Singapore got its name or, the Singapura story. The Sentosa Merlion is the biggest replica, standing at 37 meters and made from glass reinforced concrete. Now let's watch an alternative way of applying batik technique in a plain white shirt.
Then this one is an alternative batik making. Making a piece of artwork using the traditional method of batik requires vats of dyes and pans of melted wax. It's a beautiful but time-consuming process. Traditionally, batik was most often used as a method for creating designs on cloth that would be used for clothing or household items. A design was drawn with a pencil and then redrawn with hot wax using a tool like this. This is a chanting tool. Wooden stamps were also sometimes used to create patterning on the fabric. Then the fabric was dipped into various vats of dye to produce an intricate and beautifully patterned cloth. The areas where the wax penetrated the fabric would resist the dye, and once everything was dry, the wax would need to be removed by boiling or scraping the cloth. But by making a batik composition on paper, the ancient process can be taught in a much simpler way. Instead of using wax as our resist, we're gonna be using a much more modern material. This is Mod Podge, it's a super gloss version. Instead of brushing it on, I filled two different squeeze bottles with the medium. One has a thicker tip and the other is a fine liner type tip that produces a, a more detailed line. So this way it can be trailed on very similar to the way it's applied traditionally with a chanting tool. I'm using a sheet of Canson watercolor paper for my project and I have given myself just a few very fine, very faint um, pencil lines to guide my, my composition. So I'm gonna start with this thicker bottle and you really get quite a bit of control using it this way. And then if you would like to go in with the thinner line, you can just add a lot of detail this way. So once you've done all your trailing, your piping, with the Mod Podge, the composition will need to dry completely before pigment is added, um, and with one exception. While I'm using this wet medium, I wanna show you something pretty neat that can be done at this stage. I'm going to put a little bit of the gloss Mod Podge in the center of this area. Now I've decided I want this area to be textural, and what I mean by that is just very visually active. So I've just filled in this shape with the wet Mod Podge, and I'm going to use ink crystals in this area. Now these are Brusho ink crystals, and they come in these great little containers, and if you've noticed, I've, I've punched three to four holes in the top of the container. And since it's hard to tell what color I've got, I have also used a marker to put a dot of the color on top of the containers. Now these crystals can be used like this by sprinkling into the wet medium. And um, as they sit on this Mod Podge, they're gonna expand. And I wanna show you a contrast here. So this is black that I used in this area. And this was done, the process was done almost identically to that. But this is how much those crystals expand as they sit on the medium.
So it's always a good idea to use a little bit less than you think that you're going to want. Now, onto some other ways to use these crystals. In this area, I've just got a atomizer full of water, and I'm gonna just lightly mist a portion of the composition with water. Then I can go in and drop the crystals in that area, and you're gonna see how much they move. Now another way that I can do that, this is the wet area, so now over here I'm gonna drop some crystals, just dry, just a little bit there, and then I'll take my atomizer and just lightly mist. Now you can control how much water you put on this area, obviously, so in contrast where there's a lot of water used here, you can get movement, some kind of marbled effects, and I can control this and leave this grainier if I want to do that. And then here, I've just sprinkled some of the crystals into this plastic palette. You can use these as a traditional, more traditional watercolor. So I'm just adding water right to them, and you can just pick them up with a brush and use them to fill an area. Just like a regular watercolor paint. And as you can see, these crystals go a long way. This method can be used to create a very traditional looking batik pattern or a more modern interpretation, even portraiture. I hope you'll enjoy exploring batik on paper using modern materials. For a PDF and materials list of this lesson plan, please visit dickblick.com. That's all class, thank you.